Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. There have been well over 300 of them now, and um, if this is new to you, go to batgap.com, check out the past interviews menu where you'll find them categorized in about four or five different ways. Um, this is also available as an audio podcast. If you feel inspired to support it, um, it depends upon, the continuation of this show can, depends upon the support of generous listeners and viewers, and there's a donate button there. My guest today is <coughs> Prajna Paramita. She is currently in France, but is originally from the Netherlands, has been in search of her true nature all her life, and found it. Um, initially investigating and studying psychology, religion, and philosophy, she eventually met a truly awakened soul and surrendered her heart, her mind, and her life. Over several decades, Prajna Paramita received a rich vista of non-dual teachings, Advaita Vedanta, Mahayana Buddhism, Zen, and Chan. Once realized, she dedicated her life to the self-realization of all. Through satsangs, retreats, and interviews, she continually directs the listener to their very wisdom heart. These days, Prajna Paramita spends most of her time at La Rosary de Sasha, a center of awakening and natural living deep in the countryside of central France. With meditation and satsang daily, opportunity is given for contemplation and self-inquiry interwoven with the participation in projects around the property, from gardening to cooking. People remember the transformative force of play and remember what it is to live without purpose. I think we're going to want to talk about that one. Um, all are welcome at La Rosary at any stage of their awakening journey of any religion and no religion whatsoever. When not there, Prajna Paramita is giving satsang in the Netherlands or traveling worldwide. Um, and I first became aware of Prajna Paramita um, a little over a year ago. I was out in the yard cutting the grass and picking aronia berries off of a bush that we have and listening to various things on my iPad, <coughs> iPod. And uh, I listened to the talk she gave at the SAND conference in the Netherlands and really liked what she, what she was saying and how she came across. I thought, well, I've got to interview her one of these days. So here we are. So welcome. Glad we could do this. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Um, so you have a very interesting story, I think. And um, I have a few notes on it here, but rather than me reading from notes anymore, why don't you take us through it, kind of starting from your early years, whatever you consider significant. And since I read quite a bit off your website, I'm sure you know, I'll have some questions and you know, ask you for more details as we go along. Okay. Well, I was born and raised in uh, quite a fortunate situation. Uh, we were lacking nothing and um, we could have art classes and music and go to college and we were meant to go to university. It was quite an intellectual family and so that was the setting of my upbringing. And from as long as I can remember I was bored. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I didn't fit in there. and. Um, I couldn't understand that um, the grown-ups were leading such a heady life and um, I couldn't see any excitement and any real life in it. So the older I got, the more I got upset and worried because I was heading to being a grown-up and I really didn't want that kind of life. So. I remember you saying on your website something about all your friends were getting into careers and, yeah. you know, building their second home and, and so on and so forth. And you were sitting in a room leaning against a stove reading Vedanta <laughs> books. <laughs> right, yeah. That was when I was studying at university. I finally found uh, my first master who was a disciple of Nisargadatta. And the moment uh, I saw him, a wild man, who had hardly any education, but was full of life. Mm. And um, uh, he hit me so deeply. And I saw what I was looking for in his eyes, what I called home. And that was Alexander and decided, Smith, but, right? Huh? Alexander Smith. Alexander Smith. And I decided then and there that I had to glue myself to him. And uh, that's what I did for the following 10 years. Mm. And absorbed. as deep as I could. Right. Yeah. And then did you 
go on to other teachers because he died or are you just for other reasons? He died later. Before he died, I went to see Papaji in Lucknow mm -hmm. and I stayed there several winters. And uh, I loved him dearly. Uh, and were just most magnificent times, but was something lacking, mm. something like a profound spiritual chemistry was not really there. So, and I was always sick there. Uh. And then I heard of Shanti Mai in Rishikesh, and I decided to uh, to be with her on uh, on the ashram of her master mm -hmm. uh, in nature. And when I came there. Um, I had had so mu much teaching, I didn't need to hear the words anymore. But I was just sitting there mm -hmm. for many, many, many hours a day. And that uh, brought uh, the completion of the journey. Mm. Yeah. She's still alive, isn't she, Shantima? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's yeah. doing very well going around the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Is, is she Indian or what nationality is she? No, she's American. Oh, American. Okay. Yeah. I'm surprised I don't know much about her yet. Um, Maybe yeah. I'll interview her also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and even her teacher is still alive, isn't he, Maharaji? No, he no? died a couple of years ago. Okay. Maharaji, it was called Maharaji, yeah. Yeah. Very serene, beautiful, uh, silent uh, presence. Nice. Yeah. So when you say the journey was completed, what yeah. exactly do you mean by that? Um, well... That's an intimate story. Uh, <laughs> um, one night at the Ganges, when I had been in this silent place for many weeks and been meditating and really living in absorption for many weeks, one night I was uh, overwhelmed by uh, an incredible force of light. Um, that took everything out of me. Mm. Somehow. Um, and, and everything stopped. And from that day, that night on, I have not been able to find myself again. <laughs> um, I remember you saying that... Um you didn't even realize at the time that that's that, right. that, that was yeah. re really significant. Somehow it took yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no capacity to reflect at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, the, and this giant force, it was so powerful, was also so subtle that um, it was almost like a dream. And uh, I didn't tell anybody, nothing really changed, but I was completely stilled and everything that I can call I was eradicated. And after that, I was not able to talk for a long time. Liter I literally, you couldn't? Literally, yeah. I mean, you couldn't even say, please pass the salt or something, it was... That was, that was possible, Okay. but not much more than that. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So reasoning was not possible. I, it, everything was so verified that I was incapable of formulating uh, words. Hmm. Yeah. Did you have? I, I was just talking to a friend about this kind of thing about you know some of the teachers like Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie and others whose awakening was so radical that it took them a long, took them in some cases a couple of years to learn how to function normally again, if they ever did learn, um, you know, just that, you know, real basic stuff. I mean, by, uh, Eckhart had to sit in a park bench for a couple of years feeding the squirrels because he couldn't do much else. Uh, did you have a long period of integration like that? Um, well, it was, it was mainly this talking and I didn't feel like doing anything. There were no impulses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really wanted to go into the Himalayas and, and sit there for the rest of my life. Mm. But my guru said, no way, <laughs> no way, you have to go out. And also Alexander had said that already the second time I met him. He said, this is what you're going to do, mm. whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, it's going to happen anyway. 
So it must have been written on my forehead. Yeah. And uh, it is only when uh, when people want something that I come in action. Otherwise, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. By myself, there is no impulse. Still, it is like that. Yeah. Well, I'll try not to run out of questions. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like I've heard the analogy of a reservoir, and the reservoir just sits there, and it's really up to somebody to put a pipe up to it, you know. Right. And, and and then if they put a pipe up, then it can flow. And uh, and the larger the pipe, the more it flows. Yeah, that's it. Exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you say you were completely emptied out, yeah. how, what does that mean? Uh, well, um, what I find so amazing mm -hmm. that concepts, you know, um, everything is so transparent and it has lost its, its meaning and its charge. It's like they have become toys to me. Even concepts. now, Cons yeah, all concepts. Yeah, toys. Yeah. I, I, I just play, to play with them. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's something that can never be touched. And the concepts are bubbles, something like that. But they're useful, aren't they? They're wonderful. Yeah. And I love to play. And I love to play with language also. Mm -hmm. So they just don't have the gravity that they once had. Not at all. Right. No. But they're still useful. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't be having this conversation without concepts. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I love language. Yeah. Do you speak other so languages besides that, Dutch and English? Maybe French also, huh? No, no. French is not good enough. No, no, no. Uh -huh. No, I do Dutch or English. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you said... Uh, when you're describing your awakening, a, a, a force, like a powerful force. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you, do you feel that, what did you feel that force was and where was it coming from? Was it outside you, inside you, everywhere or what? Yeah, mysterious, so mysterious. Do you feel like it, it was like a, some kind of kundalini energy coming up or? I wouldn't say it was running through my spine, not like that. Mm -hmm. It was all over the place. And I think my room was also, uh, light, but mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where it came from. Huh. It was just there, and I surrendered completely. And I can imagine that if my being was not so rarefied, it can easily kill somebody. Mm. If there would have been much more mass in my cells, you know, it would have killed me. Huh. But it was so transparent yeah. already, so it could easily move through me. That's an interesting comment. I want to come back to that, uh, or we could even talk about it right now, and I'll come back to other things um, because I've, in some of the things I was reading that you had written, um, you did emphasize the value of preparation and purification and, and stuff like that. And um, some people just brush that off and don't even consider it. But um, right. you know, many right. many serious teachers and traditions emphasize the essential value of it for the very reason you just mentioned. Right, right. Who can, you know, uh, well, it is my experience. So I talk, of course, from my experience. Uh, but to be able to carry nothing and to be able to allow the light to completely permeate you, you need to be so strong mm. and so surrendered and so willing. And maybe the word purity would be appropriate too. Yeah, pure is uh, pure. Not, yeah. in a, not in a moralistic sense, but in, no. ter in terms of the preparedness of the nervous system and fr it right. fr freedom from a lot of crud and, and obstruction, exactly. you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, your nervous system must be ready. That is how I see. And I, I completely agree with you. There are so many people who see it a different way. That's fine. But this is how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. People can get easily completely mad also. Crazy, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. And there are many examples. And there are even, yeah. even examples of people who have set themselves up as teachers who got pretty crazy, you know, and, and yeah, got, know. <laughs> got kind of drunk on the energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a point worth covering, I think, um, because, 
my teacher's teacher always used to have the motto, safety first. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Who is your teacher, Rick? Uh, he was, it was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, although I haven't been with that organization for quite a while now. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I was for many years. And his, yeah. he always used to quote his teacher as, as emphasis. And he, he also, in his approach, tried to emphasize that quality of safety. You know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, you yeah. can, you can, there can be severe consequences if you push it too I hard. see like that. Yeah. I see exactly like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing you mentioned that I want to go into is that um, you said when you had that awakening, there was no, you, you, there was no sense of self anymore. You couldn't locate a self. Can, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I remember, you know, during my search, uh, these many years of despair, um, the despair was made of uh, loneliness, mm -hmm. of uh, separation. You know, I had no stuff, or I had lots of self-confidence, I had not big problems, but I had only this basic thing of profound sense of separation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, that is the center, the pivot from where we see, experience, think and feel, the center from which we measure and compare and evaluate all of that. That is dissolved. So, where am I? Well, I don't know. <laughs> no, I can't find a limit. I can't find a center. But even if there's no limit and no center, does that necessarily mean there is no sense of self? And let me just add a second point to that question. And Does the sense of self consist of these sort of negative qualities like loneliness and despair and all this stuff or is there some more kind of deep value of, of self which is not colored by those kind of uh, qualities of lack but has its own sort of intrinsic nature yeah i i can't see that the self to me as it is used in in in, in, in the spiritual books is a pointer mm -hmm. there's no such thing ultimately so when they say for self my, with a capital S, you mean yeah, that's self like a pointer? Yeah, capital S, to me, is a pointer. Okay. So, if there is no self, then what, it, what is the perceiver? It's a concept, ultimately. Okay. Well, right now you're perceiving me through, through Skype. And, yeah. uh, or at least that's the way we use the language. You know, you are perce right. perceiving me. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So that's why I say, Rick, ultimately, because ultimately uh, the words are pointing to the mystery where the words do no longer glue. How to say it? it's difficult to say it. Because all words fall short. They are, to me, pointers, all of them. So even the self, even awakening, God, all these lofty concepts, you know, that, have, that can serve you for so long and so profoundly, ultimately they are nothing, hmm. nothing there. There's a quote from sayings of the Jewish Buddhist, if there is no self, then whose arthritis is this? Who is this? Whose arthritis is this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, well, do you, so you would say that, now, let's say you get up in the middle of the night and you, to go to the bathroom or something, and you stub your toe, and it's really, yeah. really painful. Oh. Um, now, it's, you know, the pain is felt here, right. in, in this body. It's not felt by some guy in China, you know? Yes. Um, so, um, is that me? Who feels yes, the pain? That is also true. Yeah. That is also true. Uh, but it is of another order. Mm -hmm. So what I experience and I see you and we have this lofty conversation. This is our experiences that are held in time and space. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and this has a relative truth. Uh, 
so yes, I hurt my toe. It really hurts. This is also true. Okay. So would it be more true to say then, rather than there is no self, would it be true to say there is a relative self in a, con in a sort of a relative conditional sense, right. sense but, right. that, but at, at, at a deeper level perhaps there is not. Like you could say, sure, there are waves, but just because you realize that you're the ocean doesn't mean you're not also a wave. It's just not you're primarily a wave. You're primarily the ocean, but also expressing as a particular wave. Would that be? A this is exactly what I mean, Rick. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes people put it in kind of absolute terms, like nothing, you know, no self. And, um, yeah, 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 and I don't yeah. understand that. Yeah, yeah. But for the mind, it, it, is, it, is, it seems so strange because the mind says, come on, be clear. Is it this or is it that? But the heart <laughs> perfectly understands. The heart says, oh, yeah, it is this and that, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm the great unifier. <laughs> Back when I was growing up, there was a commercial on TV for these mints that you could buy, you know, and there were these two twins that were having this argument, and one was saying, it's a candy mint, and the other was saying, no, it's a breath mint, and then they were, right. go they were going back and forth, and then this, this voice comes in saying, stop, you're both right, it's two mints in one. That's it, that's <laughs> it, yeah. yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah, okay, good. So that kind of resolves that paradox. I mean, paradox is... Let's talk about paradox a little bit. I, I heard you use that word in your sand talk, and uh, it's one of my favorite words. So let's go, go on about that a little bit more. What would you like to say about paradox? Oof. Um, every statement ultimately falls short. Uh, so we can only... Uh, relate, connect, express in, in relative terms. Everything is seen from, from a particular point of view. And that whatever I say or whatever you say, whatever we experience is true because it is connected to the, from where, from the, it's connected to the place from where we speak, from where we experience. Mm -hmm. But it is only one point of view. Uh, and um, your point of view is different from mine, and both is true. Mm -hmm. So what is right? <laughs> what is true? It is all true, and none of it. Yeah, there was a line from Bob Dylan. He said, one of his songs, he said, you're right from your side, and I'm right from mine. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So do you um, have the sense that there is a larger truth which contains all points of views and recon yeah. reconciles all points of views. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Where everything is met uh, in this great mystery. Hmm. Uh, and what a silence this is, and what a peace this is, and what a source of love. To what extent do you think a human being can embody that larger reality, that larger wholeness that, that contains and, and reconciles all points of view? I think many people can. Many. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, it's a little bit difficult or very difficult for people who have a mental uh, illness. But people who are mentally healthy if they want, if they really, really want, and never give up, they can, mm. because it is our, it's our nature. It's home. This is what we are and have always been, and clouded <coughs> by ideas that we believe to be true. Papaji was famous for saying, and is still quoted by many people, people give up the search, you know? Yeah. But you just said that you have to really, really want this and never give yeah. up. How do you reconcile yeah. Papaji's statement with what you just said? Yeah. At some point, give it up. At some point, when people are really ready and mature, mm -hmm. then, then, I, 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 I say the same. Just let it all go and rest in yourself. Mm. But up to some board, uh, up to some point, you know, people must really have a lot of self-confidence 
and uh, be very honest. This is something that is easily forgotten, that people uh, think they don't need to be honest. I think you have to be bone marrow and honest to admit, you know, to see, to, to acknowledge, uh, to no longer hide and in, um, in belief systems, in uh, 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 pacifying strategies, uh, you know, all of that. You need to be very honest. That's good. Uh, yeah, you said in um, one of the, your writings, there are some qualities that greatly serve you on your inner journey. Uh, you mentioned honesty as one of them, and also trust and courage. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe we could also, maybe we talk about all three of those qualities. Yeah. Well, courage to meet your fears. Mm. Uh, and uh, maybe traumas, whatever you have been trying to run away from, whatever you have been trying to protect, uh, uh, to to just meet it and experience it and no longer resist it and no longer cling to anything. Hmm. All of that. And usually that takes a while before you can really allow everything, all of life to come and to go as it pleases. Yeah. Um. Have you experienced and observed that, I mean, what you just said, it, it takes a while. I mean, is there sort of a natural kind of, and in, in a way, even though it ultimately may not be desirable, is, is it sort of healthy in a sense that we don't open the whole Pandora's box all at once of all the, <laughs> all the fears and everything else that might be bottled up within us, but we sort of um, metabolize them in stages according to our capacity at, at each stage. Would you agree with that? Yeah, the journey that I have made and that I also go with my students is a very natural way. Mm -hmm. Things serviced by themselves in their own time and it is all perfect. Mm. It is, it's too much for many people. It's too much when it would all come at once. Right. And I've seen it with property also that people opened up like, wow, you know, I think, wow. Mm. But who can contain it? Again, Gangaji, yeah. she can contain it. Who? Gangaji. Oh, Gangaji. Yeah, she can contain it, but many could not. I, many of them I've seen half a year later, a year later, in great despair, because they have peeked into the kitchen of gods, huh. and then they have experienced how it is to be so elated and so happy and so blissful. And then again, they find themselves in their stuff. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I really have experienced over the last decades how good it is when you can contain it, mm. uh, when you are ready, when you are mature, and then stop it all. Stop all trying, all doing your best, all attempt to, um, to figure it out, you know, stop it all mm. and just rest. And how do you know when you've reached that stage? My heart knows. Mm -hmm. or, or one's heart knows. I mean, anyone who has reached that says their heart knows. Yeah, or? you know, I only know the people that, uh, that I'm with. I only know the, the, the students that I'm with. Mm -hmm. And then my heart knows. And uh, I, I tell them, just let it. Uh -huh. just, just leave it now. Just yeah. leave it. Just rest. Hmm. Yeah. Do you feel that, and have you, again, have you observed that um, sometimes these big blissful openings end up stirring things up. It's sort of like yeah. they kind of are, uh, they become like this solvent in which more of the stuff can get dissolved. And, and until that solvent is there, the stuff remains buried. Yeah, it can also be a shock that, bra that, that uh, uh, opens people. Mm. Uh, it can be, I think, many, many different things. It can also be nature. Mm -hmm. It can be many, many different things. It can be music, it can be anything that brings the next, let me say, the word layer or the next thing up to the surface to be experienced. Yeah, it's kind of almost a cliche that, you know, in, in, at least in the circles that we travel in, that, um, you know, nature is intelligent and that everything, that the world is our guru and that everything happens to us is happening for a reason and, and that, that would include even sort of 
dire circumstances. They're, they they happen because we need to have that particular experience to shock us into the next stage. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know. What I have come to see is that there is a very profound perfection and that there is nothing really out of place. Right. But I, I, I don't go in the direction of, oh, I need this because. No, this is just happening. Hmm. So in other words, you don't try to logically figure out why something is happening. You just, it's happening. Yeah, and you it's ha happening yeah. and I better deal with it. Yeah. And you, best, you probably best. have a trust that, uh, do you have a trust that all is well and wisely put and if something is happening, there, you may not know the reason, but there's some kind of divine orchestration going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a, there's a perfection moving through everything that is way beyond my capacity to understand. Yeah. Yeah, and it only, it only requires surrender. Mm -hmm. So... Perfection is the other side of surrender to me. So when I protest to something that is happening, I know I'm not bowing deep enough. <laughs> yeah. That's how I. That's how I live. That's beautiful. <clears throat> how how many years ago was it when you had that opening in Rishikesh? Almost twenty years. Oh, a long time. And um, if you were to look back over the last twenty years. Uh, would you say that there has been a continued deepening or refinement or, or some such word? No, not really. Really? No. So you pretty much are exactly the same as you were 20 years ago when that awakening happened? That is from my point of view. Maybe my students tell me different things. Uh -huh. But this is how I see. That there is really, there's actually nothing really happening. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing. So I hear from many people that they have this deepening and more subtle and more subtle. I look again and I look again and I look again and I don't see it. Well, the reason I ask that... I see the sameness. The sameness is so prominent, mm -hmm. you know, that that is what, what I see. Same, 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 same. Nothing, 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 nothing. Everything, 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 everything. Like huh. that. Well, the reason I ask that question is that you had just said that... Um, you know, there's this profound mystery, and if you feel that you're resisting something, then you haven't surrendered enough into that mystery. Yeah. And so I yeah. thought, okay, well, maybe she's surrendering more and more deeply as the years go by, that there's sort of a, a more and more and more of a complete immersion in that mystery or something. No, when I say that, that I don't bow enough, that is more on the level of that the coffee is no longer in my kitchen. What does that mean? But <laughs> it means that I want coffee and there is no coffee. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, on a, on a very sur superficial level. Little things. Yeah, little things. Okay. Yeah, little, yeah, 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 little things. And, and sometimes uh, I can have also a moment of great irritation mm -hmm. or great upset. Or sometimes when I watch the news, you know, I, I can get so upset. But it is very short. Well, How did you react to the um, the terrorism in Paris that happened a month ago. Yeah, bleeding heart. Yeah. yeah, all the time. My heart is always bleeding and I could cry for the rest of my life. But then I remember, you know, and I insist, I really insist on living love no matter what. Mm. Yeah, here's a, we asked in the questionnaire, current teaching emphasis and you said be aware on all levels of life live your spiritual yeah. insights allow love to overwhelm you be natural yeah this is how we live in france you know we live here my students come and go in the rhythm of their life what they can their families work of course so all year that i'm here the people come and go and we live as a tribe mm -hmm. And we have big gardens, and uh, we restore the buildings, and we work on the land, and we just learn to be kind with each other. And it's a very, very beautiful, nourishing, and uh, awakening way of life here, serving the people deeply. 
do you serve people outside of your little community or mainly you mean ser serving each other within the community? Um, whoever is approaching me. Mm -hmm. Just looking at some quotes from what you wrote. Uh, here's one. You said, it's not the fulfillment of desires that sets us free. It is the realization that freedom is free of all desire. Real stillness is pervading all sounds. Real stillness is nowhere not. Real stillness can be found in the midst of battle. Yeah. <laughs> this is something big I had to learn. Yeah. Yeah. It's unconditional. You know, this freedom is really unconditional. When I was with, especially Shanti Ma in those days, I, I wanted this stillness so much, you know. I wanted to be in this absorption and, uh, and and not to be disturbed but there were always constructions going on and motors and and, and people chasing me away because they wanted to do something there or uh, you know there was never a moment of or never is a big word seldom but was, yeah so it was not there but i found you know this mystery that is really unconditional mm -hmm. and it is silent no matter what so that is, of course, much more powerful. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you remember the story of the Bhagavad Gita, speaking of battle, um, yeah. that the highest teaching was imparted on a battlefield, and, you know, as, as a war was about to begin. And, uh, right. And it was imparted in response to the question from the, the warrior, what should I do in this situation? And, and the, the answer was, get established in being. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, how have you seen your students' lives uh, change and transform, and have some of them been with you for two decades or something? Yeah. Well, the man you just saw now, Shanto, is my first student. Mm -hmm. So I know him for a very long time, and with many people, we we've been together for a very long time, and it is my great delight to see the shine in their eyes. To, to see the shine in the eyes coming and the ease in their lives and the happiness and the joy, the lightheartedness. And of course, there are also people going. They're always coming and going. And then some stay. And some stay for a while and take what they want and move on. And many stay. Mm -hmm. for, yeah. As you did. I mean, you went through several different teachers. and Yes, you know, yes, yes. There's a, a woman named Mirabai Starr who um, gave this, whom I interviewed a couple of years ago or a year ago, and she gave this nice talk called Bees in the Garden, and she she sort of drew the, the analogy of honeybees that go from flower to flower and ex yes. extract the nectar and kind of cross-pollinate yes. as they go along. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. There's something beautiful in that, and there's also something very beautiful to stay with one master mm -hmm. because you go deep together. Yeah. When the trust is there, you know, you go really hand in hand and heart in heart, and and the guru can be a bridge. Yeah, you know, there's that saying of dig one deep hole rather than a dozen shallow holes. Yeah. But then somebody yeah. put a variation on it. They said, well, how about using a dozen tools to dig one deep hole? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So would you kind of say that it really depends upon the individual? Yeah, people can do what they want. Yeah. I don't want anything from them. I encourage them and show them and, and you know, enlighten their path. Well, it is up to them. And it is in their nature also how much they, how deep they want to go in their own life. Uh, um, what, you know, there's a kind of a popular sentiment among some people that you don't need a teacher and, and you can be your own teacher and and even yeah. though even the word guru has kind of a negative connotation nowadays in, in yes. some people's minds in part because of some of the stuff that so-called gurus have done but um yes. you know obviously i don't think i don't know if you call yourself a guru or not maybe you do i mean it, you can explain to us what the word actually means and yeah. and would you use the word with reference to yourself and and maybe talk a little bit about the significance of having a, a teacher yeah yeah, okay, I know what you say, I know. 
And it's almost a word that you can hardly use. And for me, it is a principle that may be embodied by a person, but it is a principle. Uh, the principle, the word is made of gu and ru, and it means eradicating ignorance, eradicating darkness. Uh, so it's completely impersonal. And I, 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 for me, the guru in the, has saved my life and brought my life into this light. So I'm incredibly grateful. And there is so much beauty and mystery in this sacred, for me, sacred connection. You know, and people can see me as they want. I don't, I'm nothing, you know, I'm nothing. But you can label me as a guru because this is the work that I'm doing. Uh, but f for me, it is empty also. Uh, it is. What, it is empty a meaning. Pardon? Privilege. What's that? In my life, this has been such a treasure and privilege. The deepest, the, the most intimate, the most sacred uh, connection. Mm. Yeah, isn't it lovely to be, to feel that you're being used as a sort of a tool of the divine? As, as right. You know, I mean, wouldn't you yeah. say in retrospect, perhaps that, um, you know, there's something much more rich to your life than there might have been had you gone and sat in the Himalayas like you wanted to. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I've known this all my life. Since I was very small, I, I knew that I would be used. I knew it all. And my masters just had to push me mm. because there was no impulse. Well, of course, it is an incredible privilege to, to share my life and what has been shown to me, you know, with so many beautiful beings. Yeah. It is sacred and it is easily trod upon these days. And the word spirituality also is a word I cannot even, I cannot even hear it anymore. It is so abused. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so either we have to carefully define our terms or we have to come up with new ones, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yes, of course, the guru is within, of course. So if you find one in the physical form, that one is holding a mirror. Mm. Yeah. What about the principle of transmission? You know, I mean, there's, um, you know, we can do spiritual practices, we can meditate and so on. But many people feel uh, that, there's a, that there's sort of a shortcut in a sense, if you can, as you did with Shanti if you can sit in the immediate proximity of someone who is living that, it, it can kind of, uh, you know, as I say, be a, a powerful shortcut. Uh, I don't know if that is a shortcut, but it is very powerful. Yeah. When you, when you are ready to receive the language of silence, then it is what a gift, what a gift, what a gift, yeah. Mm. Have any of your students woken up in the way that yeah. you did? Yeah. Or, you know, to a significant degree? Yeah. How many? Yeah, I, I really don't... Hard to, hard to give a number. It's so intimate, you know, a few. Yeah. A few, yeah. okay. But many are over the hill. Yeah. That's a nice metaphor. So they're just coasting now. <laughs> they're going to hit yeah. They're going to hit it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in one of the things you wrote that there are massive changes, not only on our planet, but in the universe. And it seems we are entering now into a completely different time span that is very beautiful, actually, that is more ruled by what's called feminine energy, more caring and more united. Um, a lot of people, I guess, so-called spiritual people, a lot of people feel that. Sometimes it seems like it's wishful thinking when you look at the news. I mean, you were yeah. mentioning earlier your reaction to looking at the news sometimes. So, so what gives you the confidence that that's actually true and that we're not just sort of, a, you know, wish, wishfully thinking? Yeah, yeah. The younger generations, the children, the creativity of the people in their 20s, in their 30s, how and how unburdened and how lighthearted and how creative, and how innovative they are. Uh, I see such a big difference between the older generations and the makeup of their psyche mm -hmm. uh, and the younger generations. I, I'm just elated. 
by by the younger people and how from the people the new is uh, brought into the world and that the big corporations are just falling apart. I mean, it seems to me there's a big battle going on, mm. you know. And uh, I may be wrong, but this is what I observe. My, the, the, the younger people, yeah. So do you feel, when, when you say the younger people, when you refer to them, are you saying that they are doing something that's explicitly spiritual, that they're kind of like there's a zeal for, you know, awakening and enlightenment and all that stuff? Or are you, are you just talking more of the arts and music and sci yeah, science fact, and whatever else they're, they're getting into? Yeah. And they, they, they want experiences. They go for the experiences. Mm. So they want also novelty, novelty, new, new. Come on, let's have something new. Experiences, traveling, experiences, experiences. And that can give them a lot and it can also hold them on a superficial place. Both. Yeah. But I feel, you know, that there was so much more density <laughs> everywhere a couple of decades ago. It's so easy now to see through everything. Everything seems to be so much more vibrant and transparent. That's nice. Uh, I've heard the analogy used that back in the days of the Buddha or whatever, there was a very thick veil and it took kind of a Superman like him to break through that veil and, and exactly. see the reality. But now it's like this thin piece of silk That's or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. And only two, three decades ago, my God, it was so thick. Mm. When I when I was in search of, of you know this big secret, there was nobody in Holland. And now, <laughs> these people, uh, you know, are everywhere. And how mind mindfulness has come into the world over the last decade. Uh -huh. So mindfulness, I mean, this we can say. This is okay to say. Sure. Uh, yeah. Mindfulness in many forms. I mean, mindfulness per se, as you know, the mindfulness practice is even being taught in corporations and stuff. But, but all all forms of spiritual endeavor are, are becoming mainstream. It seems. Most yeah. Well, particularly mindfulness. Hmm. Yeah, hatha yoga. Right. Yeah. I don't know how spiritual that is, but hatha yoga. So this it is opening. It is opening. Yeah. Well, these non-dual teachings. Not so much. Elaborate on that. <laughs> it's so radical. Radical. It's yeah. It's so radical. Too radical. I mean, Sorry. who is who is willing to give up their position? Who is willing to acknowledge being nobody? You have to give up your whole identity. Hmm. You know, everything that people have built up in their lives to come to see that there's nothing really there, hmm. and that you are not important, and you know, your all your position. This is still not so many people who really, really, really want to pierce this. Huh. But you know, I mean, non-dual ad advice. That, Pardon? Sorry. No, you go ahead. Yeah, people go to feel good. They want to feel good. But they that want to be that can be a stepping stone, though. Like you say, hatha yoga Absolutely. is that spiritual? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. but but it can yeah. be the first step for somebody. Absolutely. That's that's often the case, yeah. yeah. To feel good and to be comfortable, yeah. And you know, I mean, non-dual means right, Advaita, not two. And Advaita is the province of Vedanta, and Vedanta means end of the Veda. And so, you know, by the time you've reached the end, there's a whole lot of stuff that you may have gone through. And, but, and Veda means knowledge, so there might be a whole lot of stuff you have gone through to get to the end. So it's not necessarily that everybody in the world should just jump to the end. Uh, you know, maybe they need to go through this, that, and the other thing before it even becomes relevant right. to them, right? Right, right. It was so funny when I first met Alexander, he was talking this uh, about this immediacy mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, and the end of, of uh, cognitive knowledge. And uh, I said, okay. Give me, give me, give me, show me, show me now. You talk about me, you see, you talk about now. Come on, come on. And he was just like. Pfft. Cool it. <laughs> I was so passionate. Uh-huh.
And he said, oh, you can be here, but I don't want to hear you. So you just sit. <laughs> That's great. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I just uh, made my ears very, very big, and I was sitting there. Kept your mouth shut. <laughs> kept your mouth shut, yeah. Yeah. Uh. One of the essays that you wrote, you, you, have, you used the line, insight is not liberation. Let's right. let, elaborate on that a bit. Yeah. So during our journey, uh, life journey or awakening journey, we get many insights. Oh, it is like this. Oh, I always thought it was like that, but it is not so. Uh, so that is somebody who is having an insight, mm. uh, and that still is centered around this person who has an insight. And liberation actually is taking the insights and the one who has the insight, takes it both away. And what is left is spaciousness. So would another way of phrasing this insight versus liberation be to say insight is kind of like almost like an intellectual understanding or something, whereas liberation is experience? Kind of like the difference between understanding, uh, hearing a lecture about what an orange tastes like and actually eating one? Yeah, yeah, the insight is, does not always need to be intellectual. It can be intellectual, but it can be more profound than that. Intuitive. But yeah. still it is connected to the one who is experiencing this insight. Mm. And that one is dissolved uh, in, 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 the, in the liberation. So, just to pursue this a little further, so once liberation has been, once that one has been dissolved in liberation, are there still insights? within the context of liberation, or have you gone beyond the sort of relevance of that, of that idea of insights? I can only speak of my experience, and I don't know about spiritual insights anymore. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have insights on many different levels, on many different subjects. Of mm -hmm. course, this, this goes on, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But like uh, all these years with these beautiful insights and... Uh, I, it's no longer there. It's stopped. Mm. Would it be correct to say, just to clarify the point, that um, insights have kind of taken a subsidiary role, like a back seat, and, and the, the experience, the liberation, is the pro predominant thing. So it's not like you don't have them anymore. It's just that they're not kind of the driving force. Of, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah maybe. Okay. Um, someone sent in a question. Um, Jean Lewis Bell from Australia asks, could you talk about life without purpose? I, we mentioned that in the beginning, didn't we? Oh, yeah. uh, do you see a purpose as an important part of a spiritual path or as a burden to be free from? Is a purpose mm -hmm. something you want to do or something you have to do? Or are you better off without, are you better off with or without a purpose? I guess Ooh. that's the question. Are you better off with or without a purpose, he's asking. So when you embark on your spiritual journey, I mean, I think purpose is very important. Mm. Uh, I want to awaken. Mm. So that is the line you put out and you bring your, pen your passion and your energy and your enthusiasm, you bring in there and you are striving towards this goal. But at some point, it, it can bring you a long way, but at some point you realize that this horizon is always moving away from you <laughs> and it is it is more fruitful to see yourself as an awakening being you know that you that you're just here right here and you see yourself expanding mm -hmm. and that that gives such a rest because you take the goal out you take the time the whole horizon out you take time out and you sit in yourself, by yourself, and you just expand. And that is, uh, gives a lot of rest. That's nice. You just described my life. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there were years of desperation. And then, right. and then somehow, I don't even know when, but somehow it got to more of a, 
like you say, arresting. Uh, uh, and it's not that I, I mean, you know, people say, geez, you know, you've been at this for almost 50 years, Rick. Uh, why don't you just relax? And I am relaxed. I just, but I'm still passionate about this stuff. It's like, a, I, I, feel exactly. like it's, I feel like a kid in a candy shop. It's this great, you know, exploration, yeah. adventure, you know. Yeah. Whoa, great yeah, fun. Same as me. I'm <laughs> incredibly passionate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Enthusiastic, it's you know. Such a, it's such a help, you know, when we do no longer have to chase the goal. Yeah. And we just, Finally, relax. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's a saying, the goal is all along the path. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the path is more from the head to the heart huh. and from ignorance to wisdom. Mm. Um, you brought up a question about free will. Um, you said, uh, in, in one of your writings, you said, as long as you believe that you are somebody, that you are a person, it seems that you have a free will. So from this angle, yes, there is a free will. I'm making coffee, I'm putting on a pullover. But when you start forgetting about yourself, all of you melts into the divine will. Then you, f then you find that there is nobody to have a free will, and you realize that existence has always been expressing itself totally spontaneous by itself. Yeah. It's not a question really, but I, maybe you could elaborate on that. If you want. Let me see. Yeah, you know, something is happening and the response is so immediate and so spontaneous. It doesn't me, it doesn't need me with uh, giving it any direction. Mm. It's just ha completely happening by itself. Again, this is such a relaxation. Mm. Uh, that it doesn't need the tension of me with wanting. It is obvious. So you feel like you're not the doer. You feel like things are just yeah. happening and you're kind yeah. of... Yeah, and I dance along. Yeah, just... Speaking of the Gita, there's verses and verses in the Gita about that kind of thing too. That you know, the, It's the gunas of nature that perform action and you, know, you, you do not act at all and so on. Ultimately not, no. Yeah. But I would, can, I would echo what you said in your quote here, which is that um, if you perceive yourself as having a free will, then exercise it to the best of your ability, as long as, you yeah. as, long as that's the way you're wired. Yeah, yeah. So then make your best choices. Yeah. Um, what kind of practices do you advocate? I, I noticed in, that you... You know, you impart mantras and, and have people chanting the Gayatri mantra, and so there's and there's a your lineage does that sort of thing also. Um, want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Uh, I was raised in Advaita Vedanta, and uh, my guru uh, was mantras. No, no, no. Later, I heard which one? Which guru said that? Uh, Paul, uh, Alexander? Alexander? Alexander, yeah. right. So I, I was like, you know, like uh, looking down on mantras. Or, mm -hmm. uh, it felt like that, you know, that, that we don't go there, we don't do that. But later I heard that Nisikadatta, he always had his uh, satsangs in the attic of his house. Mm -hmm. But when the Westerners were gone and the Indians were there, he was chanting along with them and ringing oh, yeah. the bells and doing the mantras and the songs and bringing the very Indian flavor. Mm -hmm. But I never received that from my guru in Holland. Mm. And then later I came with Shanti Mai and there were all these rituals and the mantras and the singing. And I had to get used to it a little bit. And then I learned to validate that. And I learned to love it too. Mm. And uh, yeah, we bring the, the Gayatri Mantra, not many mantras, basically the Gayatri Mantra. And people who love it, they recite it. And if they don't love it, they don't. It's just one of the offerings. Like we do also fire ceremonies. And if you want it, you come. If you don't want it, you don't. But basically it is the satsang. Mm. That being together. Being together, yeah. Yeah, being together. It's so all that stuff just gives you something sweet to do while you're together. In addition, say again, I say all that stuff just gives you some sweet devotional sort of exercise to do while you're together, yeah. as opposed yeah. to just you know renovating barns or something. 
<laughs> yeah, we do that too. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and um, and we also have a, have a music group, and and we sing and like well, bhajans and things. We like yeah, yeah, mantras or songs from uh, many different traditions worldwide. Uh, wherever I come and and meet the spiritual uh groups uh, doesn't matter or if it is maori or russian or african you know mm -hmm. we learn their sacred songs and we sing them nice yeah yeah i had heard that also about nisargadatta from timothy conway um who spent a lot of time with nisargadatta and he, he said also that when, when all the westerners left you know uh, yeah. nisargadatta would get out the symbols and you know start doing right. bhajans and do yeah. pu pujas and, and all that kind yeah. of stuff it's so sweet so yeah. wonderful yeah and you know Shankar also, who was one of the founders of Vedanta, was a, a great bhakta. Also, he wrote some beautiful devotional poetry, such as Bhajagovindam, and and you know all kinds of beautiful stuff. So, yeah. it's not opposed. It's always there. Yeah. Every jnani, you know, has a bhakta heart. Yes. Uh, and every bhakta has a clear mind. Mm. So they meet. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I I feel strongly about that point because a lot of times non-duality is presented in this sort of dry, heartless tone, no. and, and I don't think that's what the the real giants of that you know. Uh, They're all juicy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they have lots of humor and lots of softness and lots of love. They have to meet the Bhakta and Gyani. They have to meet. Yeah, that's how I see it. I mean, Ramana too. Look at he was you know devoted to Arunachal, and it was a very devotional sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's something you wrote that contradicts something you just said earlier. Uh, <laughs> okay. Self-realization is no ultimate state of being. Be prepared to deepen forever, to widen forever, to be more subtle, yeah. more refined, more and more sensitive. There is no end. Yeah. Remember what we were saying half an hour ago? Yeah. You were saying nothing's yeah. changed in the last yeah. 20 years? So yeah. how, do you, how do you reconcile yeah. those? I don't know. I feel that is equally true. Mm -hmm. It's very strange, huh? talking about paradoxes, I feel that when you say this, I say yes. When we had this little conversation earlier, I say yes. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. Yeah. So that's, that's good. I mean, I'm glad I wrote that down last night because, <laughs> and again, it brings us back to paradoxes. Almost anything you can say, you can say the opposite and both are true. That is exactly so. Yeah. yeah. So nothing and changes. I, I, and I continually, continuously surprised that it is like that. Yeah. But it is so light and so playful mm. and so spacious. There's a line from a Simon and Garfunkel song, after changes upon changes, we are more or less the same. After changes, we are more or less the same. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, you also, in addition to the, you know, the singing and the chanting and the things we were just talking about, I guess you also do a private initiation with some people who want it. Um, you, what, do you give them a bija mantra or something and, and a, a way yeah, of is, technique for meditating related, with it? That is related to the lineage of uh, Shantimaya Maharaji. It's a very ancient Vedic uh, lineage and they do... Um, these initiations, yes, I do. I do it rarely, uh, sparsely, hmm. sparsely, but I do it. Yeah, it's 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 beautiful. It is, it's a ceiling. A it's a ceiling of what is already obvious inside. S, -S e a l l n g, not c e i l n g, right? It's, it's, no, it seals -E it like a S e a, yeah. S -E -A. Right. <laughs> right, yeah, and. Uh, why do you do it rarely? Because most people aren't qualified for it, most people don't want it, or what? People take things so lightly. Pardon? People take things so lightly. Sometimes they ask it, and by the time uh, the, the moment is there, they're already gone. And they're not interested anymore, or something? Yeah, they, 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 they pass by. Hmm. So, for me, you know, yeah, this is also something so, so deep. And uh, I don't want to go like woof, woof, woof with it. Right. Yeah. And so if someone takes that initiation, gets a mantra, do you expect a kind of a more serious commitment? Like you expect them to sit and actually use it on a regular basis? No. 
No? No. I got the mantra, I've hardly ever used it. Oh. And, uh, and some people love the mantra and use it all the time, mm -hmm. and some people don't, and everything is fine. I don't expect anything. Mm. I don't expect anything from them. If they want, I'm here. Yeah, that's interesting, because some teachers want certain commitments from their students. You know, okay, well, if, if I'm going to do this, then I want you to do this, you know, and there, there has to be a certain kind of dedication or commitment or something, but you don't seem to have that. Approach. Well, it is inwardly, and that's why I do it sparsely. Mm. So, okay, if they want it, then maybe a year later we do it, or two years later. Uh -huh. See if they still want Let's it. Let's see. Let's see if, if you can stand some storms and, you know, mm. let's see what we are worth together. Mm. Do you really trust me enough? Do you really trust our togetherness enough to move on also when things are not so nice? Mm. You know, let's see. So I wait. Yeah. And what would be an example of things not being so nice? Um, the, the reason I ask is that some teachers are kind of, they, you know, very strict, they, they might test their students by, you know, making them do very difficult things or being angry at them. And do you do that kind of stuff? Or are you just saying that, no. um, uh, are you always as nice as you are in this interview? No, I may, <laughs> no, I, there may be anger, you know, at some point, of course. Yeah. yeah but I don't do anger, you know, and I don't uh, test them. Life is testing them. Yeah. Life is testing them, and they may feel for me that I am testing them, but I, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. They may feel that, they, that I, I, I pressure them, but they only feel that when they resist. Yeah. Then they feel pressure. When they don't resist, you know, they get in touch with whatever stuff there is, and mm. it, it, it can dissolve. Uh, so people can come and people can go. I noticed that you said that um, you're the mother of two children and that you raised them by yourself. Um, from a very young age, did you raise them? Yes, yes. I divorced uh, uh, when the children were very young. Mm -hmm. When I met Alexander, he said, what are you afraid of? And I said, what I have to do to my children? Because I sensed immediately this will cost me my marriage. Hmm. And it did. So when they were very young, I, I walked out of my marriage. It was not possible to walk the road of truth in this marriage. And I knew that would be very, very painful to them, but I had to do it. And that, that of course, doesn't happen to everybody, but I guess maybe no. in, in your case, your husband didn't understand what you were doing and couldn't, exactly. couldn't really be supportive. And No, no. He was far from supportive and we, no, it, it didn't work. I, I tried very, very hard, but it was impossible. Mm -hmm. But I've seen with my students, when their togetherness is good, it will get better. It will get so sweet and so wonderful and so honest and so serving to each other, you know. But when it is not good, it may fall apart because mm -hmm. truth is the boss. Yeah. That's a good sign. And I feel that I'm a servant to truth. And I have to listen. And my students learn to understand that. That they have to listen to truth. Mm -hmm. And that's completely impersonal. How old are your kids now? Oh, they're in their 30s and they're thriving. Oh, they're doing fine. Yeah. Are they interested in the spiritual stuff? Um, my daughter. But she's going completely her own way and she takes, uh, yeah, she's going her own way and she's very, very wise and very wonderful. That's great. And my son is building his life and his family, but in, deep down there is the seed. Mm. So you're a grandma now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, what else would we like to cover? I have a feeling that, you know, there's a lot more you could say and you know we could go on all day but um, what do you feel is important that you would like people to know that I might not have thought to ask you uh, let me see yeah you know often people say oh my spiritual life and my daily life uh, and uh, but I encourage them not to make any split anywhere and that 
you know, that really what you see to be true, that you live that, that you don't intellectualize it, that you don't conceptualize it, you know, and that you make it separate. Okay, this is how it is. No, you have a responsibility there. You have a responsibility to live what you see, what you see, what you acknowledge to be true. Mm. And there is one life. You know, so it is rippling out this wisdom or these insights or these realizations that they have is rippling out in all their actions, in their work, in their family, with the neighbors, in the shops, and everywhere. Yeah, that's good. Um, I mean, how could you separate them? Because spiritual life is supposed to be all encompassing and all you know yes. it's it's yes. you know it's yes. it's uh, it, how can you compartmentalize or, or separate it yeah still many people uh, apparently do that yeah so again 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 i encourage them to to live it and this is all about living being natural mm. it's nothing special it's being natural and unburdened and light-hearted and playful. And perhaps treating others with compassion and kindness and all, those, all those good qualities. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, because sometimes when people get really fanatical about spirituality, they become sort of narcissistic or something, you know, self-absorbed. It's like, oh, yes. me, 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 my experiences and my, yeah. my routine and my this and my that and to hell with yes. everybody else. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's something else too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And what else should we cover? Is there anything else that, um, have you written any books or anything? Written? Yeah, well, have, you, have you published a book or anything like that? Yeah, well, uh, in two months maybe. Oh, good. It's, it's done. It's done. It's uh, in two weeks. I will send it to the publisher. Will yeah. it be in in English? In Dutch. In Dutch. First in Dutch. I will translate it. Get it translated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Be sure and let me know when you do, so I can put a, up a link to it. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank. You. And so, if somebody wanted to um, come to France, I uh, are, and hang out with you for a while. Even if they want, do you have people coming from like the United States and Australia and places like that, or mostly from around Europe? No, uh, from all over the world. Mostly, of course, around Europe, and mostly in Holland. From Holland, because I've invested most in Holland. But uh, tomorrow there are two Kiwis coming from New Zealand. So they and from England they are coming from Scotland and many and from Iceland and uh, well, many many countries. Um, the, most of them from Holland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, do you have the capacity there to um, have yeah. more people usually? Yeah, we can accommodate um, on the property 40 people and another 20 in the village. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually, we have like 20 people here, 20, and tomorrow we have 50. So, mm -hmm. I have a Christmas retreat starting tomorrow for two weeks. I see. And then every week we have like 50 people. And in Holland, when I give, we I give every six weeks a weekend, and then we have hundred people. Mm -hmm. So I like to meet people first in Holland, actually, before uh, they come to France. That is what I prefer to get to know each other a little bit because it is very intense here. Yeah, and we live all like a family here, so people must feel comfortable, you know, that we get to know each other a little bit. But what so, if what if somebody lives in the U.S. and they want to come for a while, but it's not practical for them to go to Holland first, and then that's right. So we take the risk. <laughs> yeah, or maybe you yeah. could talk to them on Skype or something and get to know yeah. them a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in a couple of months, somebody's coming. Also, that well, tomorrow people are coming that I've never met before. Hmm. We take the risk, but I really, really prefer if it is possible that we meet before. Yeah, because of the of the setting here. You know, the it, intimacy and, and the intensity. It, yeah. yeah, intensity and also that we live like a family here. Right, one big family. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want any drunks at the party or anything. Um. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Is it very expensive to come and stay there? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, we make it as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. And also, people, uh, the quality is very high. The quality of uh, the food, you know, and um, of, of beauty here and uh, the care of the animals and the land and the gardens and the kindness, uh, you know, it's all very, very high. 
uh, but we make the price as low as possible, and that is possible because everybody is helping. Right. So everybody participates on, on the land or in the house for a couple of hours a day, and we do it all together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really very, very, very wonderful. Including you, right? I mean, you get in there and wash the dishes or whatever. Yeah, including me. I'm not so much in the kitchen, but I'm at the Brambles. Oh. Get the brambles out and uh, right. yeah, I'm helping too. Yeah, and in the garden and yeah. Are there some people who live there year round? Yes, we have three people: a young couple mm -hmm. and another woman, and they hold the place, and the gardens and uh, and and the animals. Yeah, and I'm here most of the year. Can people bring children with them if they need yes. to? Yeah. The summer. We love the children during the summer. For the Christmas retreat, retreat it doesn't fit so well. Right. Uh, so we, we don't invite children for Christmas. But during the summer, I mean, there, there's so much nature and so lovely for the children and so lovely to have the children. Mm. And this vibrancy and, you know, it's very wonderful. That's, yeah. They great. love to be here also. Good. Alrighty. Well, I don't think I have any more questions at the moment. Um, and uh, if you don't have anything else from your side, I should probably wrap it up. And no one has sent in any more questions. Last chance if anyone wants to send in a question. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's really been a delight speaking with you. Um, any final words before I summarize and wrap it up? Happy Christmas. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Christmas to you. Thank you. Yeah. So I've been speaking with Prajna Paramita, and um, don't need to explain who she is because we just did that. Um, this is part of a ongoing series of interviews, um, and as I said in the beginning, they, you can find all the previous ones on batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Uh, you can sign up for the audio podcast there. Um, you can sign up to be notified by email each time a new one is posted, which is usually one a week. Um, there is also, uh, you can also subscribe on YouTube and YouTube will notify you every time a new one is posted. Um, there's a donate button, which we appreciate people clicking to help support this and, uh, several other things if you explore around. Um, before too long, we're going to have a, a, a system back in place where people can recommend guests. We haven't been, had that working for a while and it's uh, being built by someone with a nice database back end so it'll be very systematic and you can recommend people and vote for people who are already recommended and so on. Um, so thank you for listening or watching and thanks to you Prajna Paramita and we'll see you all for the next one. Thank you Rick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.